Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Made Local to celebrate the publication of the remarkable book, An Unspeakable Hope, by the incredible Leon Ford. Hello, I'm Stephanie Flom, Executive Director of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. And on behalf of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures and our wonderful partner, the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, let's hear it for them. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you to the Pittsburgh Foundation for sponsoring tonight's event and to the HERE Foundation for being a promotional sponsor. If you want to clap for them, you can too. I'm just warming you up for Leon. Thank you to Whitewell Bookstore, who's here with signed copies of An Unspeakable Hope. Leon is happy to personalize your books after the program. The signing line will form right at the edge of the stage with help from our great staff. Please join us next month on New and Noted for Central Park birder Christian Cooper with his book, Better Living Through Birding, Notes from a Black Man in the Natural World. Leon will be in conversation tonight with Julius Boatwright, a board member of the HERE Foundation and founding CEO of Steel Smiling, an organization that bridges the gap between black people and mental health support through education, advocacy, and awareness. Tonight's program is being recorded and with Leon's permission, thank you Leon, will be available to view on our YouTube channel in a few weeks and we'll send you a notice that it's ready. Introducing Leon Ford on behalf of the Pittsburgh Foundation is Kamal Nigam. Kamal is the executive director of the HERE Foundation, the first and only nonprofit in Pittsburgh dedicated exclusively to collaborating with community leaders, Pittsburgh police, residents, and the city to create a safe, thriving community for us all. Please welcome Kamal Nigam. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, as you might not know, uh, this is Stephanie Flom's very last event uh, as she heads into a well-deserved retirement. So, <laughs> I'd just like to, again, congratulate you on nearly a decade of incredible leadership and outstanding achievement here at Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. Thank you. Good evening. As the board secretary of the Pittsburgh Foundation, a supporting partner in tonight's program, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to hear from Leon Ford, a Pittsburgh activist, leader, author, and great inspiration. He's also my friend. Community safety and well-being have long been at the forefront of our public discourse, especially so over the last several years. In particular, gun violence is an urgent public health issue here at home and across the country. Since 2020, gun violence has become the leading cause of death for children in America. And here in Pennsylvania, according to every stat, 142 children and teens on average die by guns every year. In response to this growing crisis, the Pittsburgh Foundation formed a partnership with the United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania and University of Pittsburgh's Institute of Politics to raise awareness and identify actions that can be taken to protect children. As part of this initiative, John Woodrow Cox, a reporter at the Washington Post, came to this Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures Forum to discuss his book, Children Under Fire, a gripping, heart-rending account of the ripple effects gun violence has on young people in our community. Julius Boatwright, tonight's discussion leader, participated at that event, and we are so happy to have him returning. Given Julius's leadership, he is the perfect person to discuss with Leon how trauma is propagated in our community. But we are not without hope. Tonight, Leon will share his own remarkable life, captured in his appropriately titled book, An Unspeakable Hope. In discussion with Julius, Leon will speak 
to how we as a community and a society can take steps to protect our loved ones through healing, action, and solutions. Last year, Leon acted by co-founding the HERE Foundation with former Pittsburgh Police Chief Scott Schubert. I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of the HERE Foundation and have worked closely with Leon, Julius, and our full board of directors to launch and now run that organization. Not surprisingly, working closely with Leon means that I've seen firsthand the incredible person that he is. When I read his book, An Unspeakable Hope, the authenticity of his person and journey really came through in multiple ways. Leon's foundation is his family love and the community support that always connects him to Pittsburgh. He eloquently describes the unfathomable trauma and loss from gun violence that he experienced, both by being shot by a police officer and by losing many of his friends and family. I read about Leon's healing, his journey through therapy, always being lifted up by those who loved him and poured into him. And we see by example his insight and leadership, how he puts purpose to his pain from his activism to co-founding the HERE Foundation. It's quite a read, and Leon is quite a man. I have always been inspired working with him, and I'm so excited that tonight you'll get to hear directly from him. Leon, we are so grateful that you are part of our community and that you're here to share your story with us tonight. Everyone, it's my pleasure to introduce Leon Ford and Julius Boatwright. Thank you all for coming out. Yes, thank you all for being here. Brother Leon, good to see you. What's up, Brother Jules? Always good to see you. Likewise. So Leon and I, we, we have a very special relationship. And when he reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to have this conversation? I'm like, is it going to be anything like the talks that we already have to support each other, to love on each other, just to be present with each other? And he said, that's exactly what it's going to be like. So I said, of course. I want to be there. I want to share this space with you. Um, Leon has taught me so much about healing, about self-care, about just his journey uh, to helping people heal collectively as well. And I'm just just grateful and honored just to be here with you, my brother. Thanks, bro. Likewise, man. So what we'll do, um, I will take us on a journey. Uh, I tried to structure these, these questions and these excerpts from Leon's book in a way that really gives us an opportunity to, to tap into his healing journey. I know we heard uh, some comments about trauma, you know, and, and I think that when it comes to trauma, we don't have to stay there. You know, we don't have to just constantly go back to the trauma and, and live in that space. We can move forward. We can begin to heal. We can begin to focus on self-care and collective care. So in this conversation, I really want to, you know, just open that up and give Leon an opportunity to shine in that way. So this first excerpt, it reminds me of one word, and that word is power. It reads, know this, I have always been a person of importance. I have always been resilient. My life has always mattered. I am Leon Ford, Phoenix who rises from the ashes. Can you say more about that, Leon? Absolutely. Something that I learned from my parents is that they created a space for me to thrive, for me to feel safe and comfortable, to, for me to explore who I was as a person, creatively, mentally, and emotionally. But they also showed me that the world was unforgiving. And what the world does sometimes tries its best to strip us of the essence of who we truly are. And there's so many people who experience adversity throughout their lives, they forget that they're special, you know? And 
I'm fortunate for, you know, my family and people in the community and mentors who consistently reminded me that I had a purpose. I think back to me as a kid. There's a video where, you know, I'm boxing and I'm saying, I'm Mike Tyson, I'm Mike Tyson. Um, and, you know, that speaks to the aspirations of my heart, you know. Um, I always wanted to be, you know, a professional boxer. Um, unfortunately, that was taken away from me. Yet and still, I had something inside of me that I had to lean on to become the man that I am today. And I remember my grandmother telling me when I was in the hospital, she said, Leon, you got you got a testimony and one day you're going to be reaching millions and millions of people. And I looked at her and I'm like, she's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, because sometimes our loved ones pour into us and we take it for granted because we just think they're speaking from a place of love, right? Which that is that place of love is so important, but they really believe what they're saying. They're, they're, they're not just saying it, you know, to make you feel better. They're trying to remind you of that, that inner child that had this, these dreams and desires to be great, you know, and, Oftentimes, I have to remind myself of that greatness. And, you know, whenever, you know, I'm slipping, because we all have days, um, I'm fortunate that my family reminds me. And, you know, when I wrote that in the book and, you know, several times throughout the book, I'm writing from my personal experience and I'm sharing my truth, but I'm sharing my truth in a way that encourages and inspires people to pick it up, you know, to, to tell themselves, I've always been a person of importance and I'm not going to let any adversity define me or hold me back from my dreams and aspirations. Yes. Can we get a round of applause for that? Please. Thank, Thank you. you. So this second excerpt reminds me of one of my favorite words, faith. And it reads, in everything I do, I let that sensation of hovering, of tranquility, guide me. Many people look at my life and assume that I am a big planner. I'm not. Experience has taught me to follow my intuition Chase that feeling of peace and trust that all will work out. I'm the type of person to jump out of an airplane and build a parachute on the way down. <laughs> that is the level of faith I have. I am such a spiritual person, Leon. Faith is so important to me. So we'd love to hear you say more about that excerpt. Yeah. So throughout my life, I've always felt guided. And this is something that, that I share with so many people who also grew up in similar environments. Right. Um, I've traveled the country and I've met, you know, people from the hoods of almost every city. And something that we all have in common is this ability uh, this in intuition, the ability to read the room and just navigate spaces. And I focused on that. As I was writing this book, I thought about that, that feeling that told me to leave a party because something was going to happen and I left and some, somebody got shot, right? Um, and as I began to study that feeling, I realized how that, that, that intuition kept me, you know, safe through those uh, moments where I had been forced to survive. So what happens when I lean into that, you know, that feeling and I allow it to nurture me thriving, you know, um, and that is what strengthened my faith. And so I began to like communicate with, with some people call it God, that, you know, the higher power, um, but, you know, I began to have faith in this feeling that was literally guiding my steps every step of the way. It's like I would, you know, 
And I know I always knew when it was real because I would wake up with this burning feeling like I have to do a protest. <laughs> like I have to do it now, uh-huh. you know. Uh, and I would do it and like wasn't a lot of planning, you know. Uh, it was just literally like these moments lined up, you know, and that's what my life has been from uh, from activism to launching a foundation to uh, my work, you know, in the venture capital space. I just been faithful and I'm, I've learned something that I had to unlearn from my father. He's, he, he doesn't trust people. You know what I mean? He, he's very aloof. And I said, you know, and it's a balance because um, I, I recognize that there are good and bad people, you know, in the world, people who try to take advantage of you and things like that. But I surrounded myself by really, really good people and having that discernment. So it's like, that. I don't know if you just, you know, got to be distrustful or you just got to focus on the type of people you got around you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um but faith has allowed me, it, faith has empowered me in ways that I attract really powerful people, positive people. Even today, uh, I took a you know stop to get some lunch and there was this homeless guy. And it, it was funny because I saw him coming. I know him. I always see him. I saw him coming over and he already knew. He's not, I ain't going to ask Leon for no money. <laughs> Right. Uh, so I'm like, you hungry? He's like, yeah. I'm like, sit down with us, you know. And I had my team with me, and we're sitting down. So he begins to talk to my team, and he goes, I know this guy, right? And I would ask him for some money. He said, I ain't giving you no money, but I'll give you some food. And I start laughing, right? Um, but it's those moments, right, that strengthens my faith because he was hungry. You know what I mean? And we saw each other at the right time for him to get a a, a meal, you know? And that's how life works. If you just stay the course, whenever you're low, you you might get a random funk. We've had these moments where, you know, um, I reach out to you or you reach out to me and we're like, yo, this is right on time. I needed this. (laughs) You know what I mean? And that, you know, is so powerful. And I think, you know, sometimes we undervalue those those subtle experiences and how God shows up in many different ways in our lives. And for me, I give I give credit to God every step because mm-hmm. it's those moments that strengthens me, that keeps me creative and innovative and on my path. Yes. Yeah, strong faith. <laughs> strong, relentless faith. So another word that came to mind as I was reading Leon's book is something that he just embodies so well is love. And this excerpt reads, authentic power cannot be taken away. How can we empower every human being on our planet? We do so through love. Love begins with the healing and evolution of self which then serves as a catalyst to heal, evolve, and strengthen your family. Healing and strengthening families will lead to community peace. That level of peace can expand to include every individual, family, community, city, state, country, our entire world. This process starts with the self. I love this, Leon, because it makes me think about this idea of like scaling love. You know, how do you scale love? We talk about in the nonprofit and business world, how do you scale, you know, your business? Um, But Leon is showing us how to scale, you know, something that we feel, but, you know, you can't see it. So we just love to hear you share how you're scaling love. Yeah, thank you. This um, excerpt is interesting because it's both about community, but it's more so about self, right? Um, And I I believe that sometimes we focus so much on the work and community and board meetings and raising money. 
and we undervalue the significance of just being a kind human being. And in order, thank you. (laughs) And, you know, in order to be the person that, or be the leader, right, um, that we want to be in our communities, we first have to love ourselves, right? And from my personal journey, and I wrote about this in a book, me learning to love myself again, me giving myself grace after my mistakes, that is what enabled me to forgive, right? And to love and to collaborate. And that level of self-love, it, it kind of like, it silences the ego, you know? And, you know, in a lot of spaces, you know, the ego shows up and, you know, you don't know people's intentions and all these different things. But when you love yourself, you don't, like, for me personally, I people are like, yo, what's the this police intentions? I know what my intentions are, mm. you know? And so I'm not concerned about what somebody else's intentions are. You know, and so I believe if more people can love themselves, if more people can give themselves grace and space to heal and evolve, it transforms family, right? Um, and then that extends toward community. And so the other piece to that is, you know, we we see the righteous folks, folks on, on social media, and, you know, most of the people on social media judging people and all these different things, you know, you look at their families, we all got a little dysfunction in our families. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care if you live in Sewickley or Homewood. It's like, there's a little dysfunction, right? right? But how do we, you know, uh, work through that dysfunction with love? You know, um, I wrote in detail about, I had an Uncle Sonny uh, from Garfield. Everybody know my Uncle Sonny. And, <laughs> and um, he was an alcoholic, you know, and I, they used to make me follow him to the bathroom so he didn't steal anything. <laughs> and, and, but we loved him, yeah. you know, despite yeah. his shortcomings. And it's that type of love that I believe is transformative. Mm-hmm. And, you know, while... I'm super grateful for the uh, philanthropic community. Um, Sometimes the work can come off a little transactional, you know? And and so I believe that through relationships, uh, through collaboration and through the sharing of of love, compassion and understanding, we can move from transactional leadership to transformational leadership. Yes. So this next excerpt, uh, I've categorized it as self and collective healing. And Leon starts to talk about therapy, one of my favorite things in the world. Therapy has completely changed the way that I view and interact with myself and the world. Therapy has helped me to trust myself, which has in turn taught me how to trust other people. Often we carry emotional baggage, including fear of abandonment and rejection, overwhelming guilt and anxiety that shapes how we make decisions. I encourage people to be mindful of what they are carrying And to become aware of how that emotional baggage affects their daily lives. Think about some things that you may be struggling with. Then consider what it will take to heal. I love that so much, Leon, because that's the journey that I've been on in therapy, thinking about my own emotional baggage and how it shows up in relationship with people. And it just... You know, you model that, you show us that it's possible to heal that, that, that stuff, our baggage and be in real relationship with people. So if you could just talk more about that, that would be great. Yeah. So healing is very important and I don't believe anybody makes it to the 
space of being healed because life is going to constantly challenge you and trigger you and test you over and over and over again in many different ways. And so for me, therapy was a, a safe space for me to acknowledge all of my shortcomings, right? To put the mirror up and to help me work through those challenges. And a lot of times we don't realize the way we show up and deal with adversity, we're going back to how we learn to protect ourselves as children, right? And so if you grew up in a household where you felt like you didn't have a voice or you you know, um, you know didn't have the opportunity to, to voice your emotions and feelings, as an adult, you may shut down in your relationship. You know, if, if you're triggered and there's some type of conflict, you may be very avoidant. I'm very avoidant. I avoid conflict. It's something that I'm still working through, you know, even, you know, in my leadership, you know? Um, and so it's not something that we should judge people for. It's something that, you know, we, I'd encourage us to create spaces to acknowledge how we respond to triggers, you know, what, to, to think about what our triggers are, a lot of people don't even know what their triggers are. They're, they're navigating life and something happens and they shut down and they just don't feel good, but they don't realize that they've been triggered, you know, um, by something, you know, it could be at the job or with a relationship or whatever. Um, and so therapy has helped me identify those triggers, work through those triggers and create healthy coping mechanisms so that I don't project my brokenness on somebody else, you know? And as a community, just think about all of the different people who have experienced an astronomical amount of trauma, who has never had any type of therapy. They're there, I, my, my grandma, like, her therapy is calling like five different friends, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> who like, they, they love each other, uh, but they don't have the tools right or the resources to help work through that level of of trauma and you know adversity and, and so um I'm a huge advocate for therapy I believe that as a community we should not only should we talk about it more um but we should work together to make sure everyone has access to therapy because that's the other side of the conversation um you know, there's so many hoops and loops that you have to, you know, go over and cross to even see a therapist. Um, I know people who are on waiting lists to see therapists. So it's, it's you know, really difficult, you know, um, I, right now. Um, but I also encourage those people who are empaths, who love picking up that phone for their friends and, you know, loved ones. Like, yo, like we, we should encourage people to become therapists. You know, and we we need more um, therapists who look like us in in communities because I, I know a lot of people who are like, yeah, I want a black therapist, or I want a, a black woman or a black man. Um, and you know, I know my therapist. She like don't recommend nobody else because they're gonna be on the waiting list. <laughs> <laughs> You're like they gonna be on the waiting list, you know. Um, but and and but people need that help, and so I'm very transparent about sharing my personal journey. Um, it, when you read the book, there's going to be some stories that just catch you off guard. You're going to be like, whoa, I didn't know this about Leon. Uh, <laughs> but I, I shared those stories to help people understand that, you know, I, I didn't let my worst moments or my wor worst decisions define me. And I came up out of it. But, and I also showed a reader how hard it was to come up out of it. I don't, I'm not sitting up here before you like, yeah, it was easy. And like, I just woke up at 5 a.m. every day and I was <laughs> successful. <laughs> you know, that's how the motivational speakers be. You wake up at 5 a.m. and just work out and just you change your life, you know? It was like real tough, you know what I mean? It's like some dark moments, you know, where I had to call a friend, you know, I had to get a therapist when I, you know, couldn't talk to the friend anymore and or the friend's like advice just wasn't good. 
you know? <laughs> You know, it's called like that. I don't want to live. He's like, suck it up. <laughs> you know, but you know, with that advice, it helped me a little bit because I'm like, all right, but you know, but it was a point where I'm like, yo, dad, suck it up ain't enough, you know, and and so as a community, it's, again, it's important for us to have these types of conversations, to lead by example, to highlight the success but also acknowledge that it wasn't easy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. So this is another excerpt on self and collective healing. Talks a little bit more about Leon's journey in therapy. It reads, in therapy, I learned that everybody wants three things. Security, connection, and personal power. Healing involves all three elements. How do you get to a place where you feel secure within? How can you become connected to others in a meaningful way? How do you gain a sense of personal power? I truly believe that with some work, all of us can heal no matter what we have been through in our lives. And so, Leon, we heard a little bit about the HEAR Foundation earlier. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you do with the HEAR Foundation and how that element of healing comes up in the work? Absolutely. So you may have heard me say this quote on Good Morning America. When the flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Right? Right. And so I believe we are all flowers. And in order for us to thrive, that security is very important. When I think about some of my mentees in like Homewood or the Hill or Northview Heights, a lot of them don't feel safe. They don't feel a sense of security, especially even when they got to think about what am I going to eat when there's teddy bears on the ground because somebody was just murdered. It's really hard, right? And so for the Hair Foundation, we want to create a sense of safety and security for communities. And if you look at our board, you know, it, here's the thing. Police community relationships are very important. But if you look at our board, it's much bigger than police community relationships, right? We want to create an environment in Pittsburgh of public safety goes far beyond police community relations. And so if you look at, you know, we have federal judges on our board. We have, you know, people from the county. We have people from like the president of CCAC. We have president of a bank, you know, uh, folks from UPMC, right? Any, like that report that came out a few years ago uh, saying how bad Pittsburgh was for black people, almost any leader who's running an institution or, who does work in community sits on our board, right? And so we're really trying to transform this region through relationships, right? Through meaningful relationships, hope, and inspiration. And the second uh, piece, there was security, connection. That re Those relationships are so important. And I think we undervalue the significance of human connection you know, when I was in a super dark moment, and I wrote about this in my book, I I was re like I woke up in the hospital, and I began reading the uh, articles online. So I never, you know, I didn't wake up and it was like, yo, this is super racial. I wasn't even thinking about race. I was like, yo, I got shot. Then I read this article. It was like black teen sh shot by a white officer, and I'm like, oh, it's about race now, right? And I start reading the comments and. They every negative racist thing that you could think of was said about me and my family. So I was like, yo, I hate all white people and I hate all police officers. But then my nurses came in and I was I was actually shackled to the bed. My nurses came in and my doctors came in and they took good care of me and they advocated for me in a way that made me love and respect them. And so I told myself, well, I hate all white people but them. <laughs> you know? Right? <laughs> human connection. Right? Because, like, we're humans and things happen. Right? And when things happen, we be like, yo, like, I don't want to go to Homewood. 
you know, I don't want to go to this place. But then we meet people from these uh, places and we're like, yo, this is actually a good person, you know? And, and so hu- through human connection, we can transform our city. And Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is a very, it's a small city. We're all one degree of separation away from whoever we need to talk to, you know? And so with, with my belief in human connection and relationship, like, bro, when you grow up in the projects, relationships, everything is relationships. You know what I mean? My dad went to prison and all his friends took care of me. Christmas, I ain't never had a bad Christmas, bad birthday. People just pull up on, like, relationships. My grandma, you know, would have tons of people coming in and out of our house for food. You know, people lived there. I didn't even know whose name was on the lease, right? <laughs> relationships, right? And, and so I still carry that with me, the essence of, like, that communal love. We, we, we take care of each other. We look out for each other. And I believe the Hair Foundation is no different, you know? Um, people at the... Um, Pittsburgh Festival of Books, uh, Tiffany came and she came with a few officers. People were so surprised to see police officers there. I was like, yo, this is my friend. <laughs> like, yeah, she yeah. she's here, you know, because these relationships, you know, are real. So there, there was security, connection. And, and personal power. Personal power. This goes back to self-love and accountability, right? When you When you have that self-love, you hold yourself accountable. You hold yourself to a standard, and you you have sovereignty over yourself. Right, there's nothing that you can't accomplish. You know, I felt like I could do anything. You know, and I had these ideas and the connection and the security, and I was able to co-found the Hair Foundation. You know, and so with those three things, you know, I believe that we can transform the nation. Right, but we have first like let's start with Pittsburgh because we have the relationships. There's no reason why the the president of this corporation doesn't want to talk to the president of that corporation. There's no reason why you know the superintendent from public schools ain't meeting with this person. It's like we all should be putting our minds together, you know, and, and figuring out you know what talents and skills and gifts and relationships we have that we can leverage to transform our city, yeah. you know? And so that's just, that's my perspective. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank you. So to build on that, we'll hear an excerpt that focuses on purpose. There's a certain level of power when two people with opposing views are connected by somebody that they both love, respect, and appreciate. That's how you get things done. I use this approach all the time to bring together individuals who disagree with one another. With me in the middle, both sides know they're in a safe space where neither will get violated. So when when I think of the Hair Foundation, that's like the sweet spot bringing folks that are from, you know, different walks of life with different views together to see that they have a lot more in common than they do differences. So just love to hear you talk a little bit more about how that is manifesting through the work at the Hair Foundation. So I will, I'll back up for a second because that was easy, right? I'll tell you what was hard. So, one of my friends got arrested for a homicide when I was like 16. And I remember I wanted so badly to go to the trial. But my mom was like, you're not going to, down there. You know, you're not being associated with that. So I was pissed. Right. And so I never knew the family of the victim who was murdered. And so years go past and, you know, I see this guy in passing, we're going to parties at uh, Older Dice. They said these parties called the jump off at Older Dice. And there's this guy, mentor, chaperone, and he kind of kept us out of trouble. And he took a liking to me. He became one of my mentors and actually gave me uh, one of my first speaking engagements. That was Jason Rivers. Yeah. Wow. And so J- Jason Rivers became my mentor and... I got real close with him and his family. 
And I would go to his house and they would talk about his brother who passed away. And one day I remember making the connection that my friend who was convicted of murder was convicted of murdering Jason's brother. And so I would literally be in my car talking to my friend outside of Jason's house before I go into Jason's house with his family who was still grieving and, you know, talking about this loss. And I felt so conflicted. You know, this is two completely different worlds that I I live in because I love my friend who was incarcerated and I love Jason and his family. And so my friend wrote me a letter and he, it just showed us humanity. You know, it's just like, man, I wish I could be there with you. I'll be taking your wheelchair apart and I'll push you wherever, you know, just showing his love as a friend. And uh, one day I gave it to Jason and I was like, bro, this is my friend. And Jason sat with it and we had plenty of conversations about this. And one day Jason said, I want to meet him. And I reached out to my friend who was incarcerated and I told him we got Jason on the visiting list. And Jason and I drove up to the jail and we we met with him. And it was so powerful. I didn't know what to expect. But it was so powerful. I remember um, the way the visiting room is set up. You know, I, I would sit across from my friend and there would be a seat in between him and Jason, you know. And uh, we went maybe about three or four times together. Um, and like the fourth time, I remember we're sitting there and we're talking and uh, Jason went to the bathroom and when he came back, he sat right next to my friend. And I caught it. I was just like, whoa, like this is powerful. You know what I mean? And so being, you know, in a, in a space where there's a life that was lost, you know, that was a cha- that was difficult. And these are both relationships that I did not want to lose. Right. And so facilitating relationships with leaders who care about Pittsburgh, right? And to, you know, to share my 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 story and to build with Scott, that was much easier. Because we were at a pivotal moment in our city where everybody wanted to make a difference. And we recognized that there was an issue with policing. You know, there's no way to to, to, to get around it. Um, and so we had several meetings and most people were like, yo, man, I want to do something. You know, um, it took it a lot of meetings, though. You know what I mean? Because we didn't just want you know, people to just commit and not do the work. We met with people who, you know, were really committed, who stood behind their word that we believed in, uh, that believed in the mission that we could, you know, collaborate with across many different sectors. And we have so many different, you know, uh, personalities, uh, many different, you know, points of contact and relationships. So, you know, it's, you know, it is a challenge sometimes, right? Because everybody cares about these issues, but when we're able to lean into something that we care about, that's the big step. Like once we can acknowledge we care about this thing and I'm willing to commit my time to it, you know, now it's just having a plan and figuring out, you know, the goals, tasks, roles, and responsibilities. And, you know, for me, I I believe that is one of my skills. You know, I'm not the guy who's going to be, you know, um, leading the organization on day-to-day like Hamill. Um, But, you know, I I have vision, you know, and uh, I recognize my strengths and my weaknesses and we're able to build, you know, teams around you know, those strengths and weaknesses. And so I think that's a other, another good, um, you know, characteristic to have to, you know, to know what your flaws are, right. And to build a team around you so that you don't fall, you know, we all stumble sometimes, but if you got a good team around you, they're going to catch you, mm-hmm. you know, a good team professionally and a good solid family and, and friends around you personally. Yes. Yes. What up?
All right, so we've come to our last excerpt. And this one reminds me of the word limitless. I discover that my wills have wings. Know that I am still rising. How high I go is up to me. What is next for Leon Ford? I'm I'm just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> So it's interesting because um, that's the last sentence of my book. And uh, the first excerpt that you read is the last paragraph of the uh, prologue of my book. And you have kind of put those two sentences together, right? Um, So what's next for me? I've been thinking about this a lot lately because November 11th, 2003, 22 marked 10 years since I was shot. And then March 16th of this year, I turned 30 years old. And I've been reflecting about my life up until this point. And uh, really from November 11th, 2012 to now. And I, I, th- I think about what I was able to build on brokenness. Right, like my foundation was super shaky. I was depressed. I was suicidal. I was homicidal. I was, you know, insecure about myself, um, uncertain about what my life was going to turn out to be. Um, and I, and but I was able to accomplish some things, you know, in ten years that some people don't accomplish in a lifetime. And I was able to kind of build myself up. And I, I come from a very loving family. So if I didn't have the will that I have right now, I would still be living at my dad's house or living with my mom. And they would make sure I'm fed and clothed. <laughs> like, literally, like, they would make sure I'm all right. You know what I mean? But I had this will to just say, yo, I'm going to do something. And I'm not going to let anybody forget me or my name. And so I sit back and I'm plotting on what the next 10 years is going to look like. I was speaking with a friend of mine, a mentor, and came up with three pillars for the next 10 years. And the three pillars for my next 10 years are philanthropy, storytelling, and investments. Mm -hmm. And so with the philanthropy, obviously I want to grow the HERE Foundation. I also want to do some things on a national level. Storytelling. I actually did my senior project on digital filmmaking and video production. And so I see myself leveraging my book to become a icon in TV and film, similar, what's up, bro? Uh, <laughs> uh, similar to the way like Fifty Cent was able to leverage his album and his music yeah. career to get into TV and film, um, and then for the investments, um, I'm with a venture capital firm called Bronze. And up up until this point, we raised fifty million dollars. We're currently raising twenty five more million dollars, um, so it's going to be seventy five million total. And I want to invest in social impact companies, uh, companies that I believe in, companies that are changing the lives of people around the world. So that's what's next for me. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you all for being here. Um, Leon, I, I think I can speak for everyone and say that we we love you. We value you. We appreciate you, brother. And we need you. We need you. Um, Leon Ford. Thank you. Thank you.